All right, welcome back to session two. Um, we're gonna kind of get right into it. Um, we can review stuff from yesterday for, for the first session, um, but before we do that, were there any outstanding questions? Did anyone have any struggles in doing some of this, the homework over the, the last couple of days? Toss a hand, unmute, shout it out, whatever. If not, we'll just kind of go through a couple of key elements. Everyone good? I, I'd like to know how to group. Perfect. So let's start sharing and I will show you. So okay. the one of the um, best things about Canva is that it makes it super simple. So let me come over to, here, I'll come to this one. So I have this box, right? And that box and that text are two separate items. There's two ways to do it. There's sort of the old school way, which is you click on one, hold down the shift key, click on the second one. Once you do that, this little bar, this little sort of formatting bar will pop up and you'll see the word group, All right? One of the nice things about Canva is that sometimes, you know, you might have like a ton of different layers and you accidentally get one thing hidden behind the other and you can't shift click on what you want. One nice thing that Canva does is if you go to position and you see your layers, you can do the exact same thing where you click on the actual layer and then shift click on the second layer. So you don't have to actually do it on sort of your canvas or your working area. You can go to position, go to layers and do your shift click. And that's super helpful because if we're in a situation like this on this first page, if I have a ton of different things on there, it might be hard to discern which is where. But, you know, if I just click on any one of them, I just go to position and I could say, you know, oh, wait, I wanted rodeo and this torn one. I can then just do shift and I click. Now you notice that fills in because shift click fills in your sort of top to bottom. So then what you would do is you don't want to just click because if you just click, it'll deselect. But what you do instead is command click on the Mac or it'll be control click on the PC where then you're selecting things that are out of order. If that's too complicated, what you could always do is if you're grouping things together, odds are you want those layers most likely near each other in some way, right? So if it's if it's sort of too overwhelming to try to like control click or, or command click around things, all you can do is just take the one layer you want to group and just move it next to the other layer. And then it'll be easy to just shift click the two of them. So shift click, and this goes for anything like shift click is, um, I'll stop sharing for a second. So like, even if you're looking at like your finder window or you're looking at a list of files, Click on the first one, shift click at the bottom will select everything in that range. Command or control click will let you sort of like select other every other one, every third one, whatever. And that little trick works across anything for selecting multiple files, multiple elements, multiple whatever. Those are all, like I said, shift click is a range, control click is, or command click is every other one. Cool. One thing I do want to um, point out, and I'm just looking at my notes to make sure that we, um, as we go into something new, I realize that like things people don't necessarily notice all the time are like the site settings. So this is going to matter when you start talking about connecting things to drive, talking about adding video, talking about adding audio, things of that nature. So what you always want to do is when you always want to be aware that in the address bar up at the top, you have this little lock icon. This little lock icon lets you know what this application, what, what this website has access to do. It's not just this tab. Once you grant it access to the microphone, the camera, whatever it may be, it's going to do it for the canva.com. This is going to matter as you do most anything because we're start, we're always kind of leaning now towards in life you know, video, audio, tutorials, things like that. You know, a lot of what we do is not just text-based anymore. You know, people want to watch the video about the lesson or people want to watch the recording. So you always want to make sure that is where you're looking if you're having any troubles. And if there's any troubles where you're not seeing something, let's say microphone and camera weren't there, you click site settings. Site settings just opens up the settings of Chrome, but it lets you know it's for canva.com right here. 
And then you can choose, you can, you know, to ask, default, allow, block, whatever. This is where then you can set them. Once you change any of these, don't be freaked out. If I were to change one of these, what would happen is back over here, it would give me a bar that would say you need to reload the page, essentially because we just changed the site settings. So I would need to reload the page and that's fine. So just be aware of that's what that is and that's where that is when websites are asking for like permission to upload, permission for audio, permission for video. Sometimes it's even pop-ups because some, not Canva does other tabs, but some websites like Infinite Campus for one, when you do the report card generator, like that actually pops up as a secondary window. So it's considered a pop-up. That's where you allow access to little nuggets like that, that you may need to allow or disallow depending on the program you're using. Chris, how did you get to site settings again? So right up here, the address bar. Yeah. There's a little padlock. And if you click the little padlock, you should be able to see site settings. Okay. Cool. And it opens it up in a new tab. And like I said, when it opens it up, you'll actually see it's just the full Chrome settings window. But this section right here tells you you're just setting it for canva.com. So everything below this only applies to canva.com. You know, if you were doing it on Adobe, if you're doing it on Google, whatever, it would give you the domain that that's applying to. So it doesn't mean you're turning on the camera or the microphone or whatever for every website. It's just for this one that's listed right here. Cool. All right. Now, before we start sharing things, because I do want to see some of the stuff you guys have worked on. I want to share, I'm going to share something I've made. And there's a caveat to this. And the caveat is, as we're building, you know, we don't necessarily want to start out with these templates, right? Because that's part of that review from the other days, because you kind of get sucked in and locked into these things. But as you get going, and as you're thinking about how you're going to make new things for yourself, new things for your class, there's no harm in looking at these for inspiration. Right, where you may look at one of these things and be like, eh, I like this or I like that, and kind of get ideas for how you may position text, you know, on the side, or how you may use like this particular one right here is um, I'll add it as a new page. You may say, like, how do I use color? I want to have color. Oh, okay, they use color in a really nice way. You may look at this just to give some context and some like inspiration to say, all right, it's colorful, but. It's not. There's really only like three colors in this. There's blue, there's purple, and then there's a little bit of this green in this image, white, black with text alternating. So if you really want to get super specific, there's really like two colors, which is the blue and the purple that are offset because even these little bullet points are blue. Even these little lines are sort of like a dark purple. So you may use this to think about as like we were talking about at the end of the last session, kind of creating your own look and feel with like your own particular color scheme, knowing that it's super simple, super clean. And you may use these things again as inspiration as you create your own. So one of the things that I used for inspiration is not that one. Now I gotta find it. Here, let me come over here. So as I open it up, I'll show you, um, just as a reminder too, like in your Canva dashboard, and we talked about this, you have the Scarsdale Schools Education. And I know the Edgemont folks don't have that here, but if you click on that, you may have other teams from prior logins. So you want to be careful to know that you're working. We want to now going forward, be only working in the Scarsdale Schools one. But if some of you say, oh, I made something and now I can't find it, it may be because it's under your you know, your name team, as opposed to the Scarsdale Schools team. Everything Canvas said is that you're not going to lose them. You just don't have access to the same stuff. You just have to toggle between them. Um, and so one of the things, just to give you a sense of how I've used these things myself for inspiration is, oh, uh, where, no, not Casal templates. I wanted to go to, I looked at an infographic, and this goes back years. I looked at an infographic template to do my tenure portfolio. So what I did was I created, I sort of looked at how a bunch of different 
infographics used color, how they used sort of blocks of spacing. And what I did was I tweaked it. I made it my own. I made a blank one. You know, I made it my own. But I essentially then took this and made an infographic as my tenure portfolio, which was also fun because as a computer teacher, it was kind of cool to hand a piece of paper to my principal to be like, here's my tenure portfolio. But this is how you can use these things as inspiration. But then also as you're building these things, think about, well, if I built this as a tenure portfolio, I can now use this as a mentor text if I want to teach students how to do an infographic about themselves. You know, maybe for you high school teachers, you're working on having students create, you know, resumes or not so much resumes. Resumes are a little like old school, things like infographics, things like this. You can, you can build your own one of these that becomes the template for your students to kind of learn and base off of. Or you could also give something like this once you have, and you guys have already technically now created two templates. You created your welcome to my classroom template for yourself and you created your like newsletter, welcome back, whatever that second project was. You can now turn those in to templates for the kids, right? You basically will, can just share that with them and say, use this as your baseline, recreate it with your information. You know, welcome to my room welcome to my whatever and then the students can then use those things as inspiration as well as mentor texts for your own project cool a little quick recap a little quick bits of nuggets any questions all right cool so let us do this um i got that let's share a couple of the bits of homework um and then I'll show you guys some of the next steps before I cut you loose on some independent work. Vicki. Hi there. Okay, we'll attempt this again. Yeah. So as you know, I'm not a teacher. So I, and I don't do newsletters. So I didn't think you mind if I do something that was useful at work. Completely. <laughs> Completely. So I attempted our poster that I put up every year that all the staff sign up for committees and Perfect. um it's like welcome staff you have to sign up for stuff okay so um let's, I, let's see if let we saw your screen share thing yesterday yep let's see if I found my screen share thing hold on one second okay Perfect. so I have I have a pro this program I am I, I could get lost for hours just searching at colors and templates and whatever. And so this is not done because I spent a lot of indecisive time looking at stuff. That's fine. But, it is awesome. Yeah. So I, you know, at first they, I have all these pages. This is not done. Okay. First they started out, you know, putting it in this form and I thought, wow, this looks kind of scattered and messy. So then I saw this, this looked kind of, cleaner this kind of format but then it wasn't going to fit everything that i was going to fit so i had to make divide things into um smaller blocks um and then um what was i going to say about that okay so then it's like you get like i you know as far as learning the program it was okay how do i make different blocks the same size is there a function that i could select everything and size them the same and i really didn't find that but what i did find was you know um you could select what you want and what's helpful is aligning elements where you can align things you know to the top middle right center so if you have all these objects you want to align you can do it like that um oh, and the other thing is like if you get one looking good like in your case and i love how you've used their templates to kind of you've reworked them because you've seen the limitations and you've done them. What you could do in this type of situation is like you get one and you think it's the right size. You can right. du duplicate it. So you can duplicate that one box and then just slide it over duplicate, slide it over. Then if you know you have three and those three look good, you can click on the first one, shift, click the other two to select all three, duplicate. It'll give you three new ones and then you just drag them down. Right. Yes, like, yeah, exactly. And then the other thing was, it was like, oh, well, I want to use all these colors, 
what kind of colors can I use? I happened to find this random thing and Keith Coat, um, Keith Coat colors are like gold and yellow and black. So, I, you know, I found this and I'm like, well, how would you reflect this graphic? Cause these were all pink to these blocks. So I realized you could, you know, select what, select what you wanted. Say this was a different color. You could go here. And then when you hit add a color, I discovered the color dropper. So you could like select the color dropper and then you could pick anything you want. So you could just pick this and it would make that, that. So you could oh. copy stuff from other stuff. <laughs> you went, you went down, you went down the super technical rabbit hole. Yeah, exactly. Right. And yeah. So then, um, then, you know, I was like, you know, I was like, oh, let me search for yellow Pantone colors and all this stuff. I, like I was like spending way too much time on colors and stuff versus the information. But so then, um, yeah. And then, you know, just like put it like I have all this text and it looks messy. And so how do you make it look streamlined and no, but I mean, I think so far that, I mean, I think that was sort of a lot of the point of what I wanted you guys to do is to have something like this to kind of work through that process of what am I having? What I know what I need. How do I make it? And then go through that sort of iterative process of using those different pages and trying to figure things out because this page is definitely the more refined version of those previous ones. So, I mean, I think right. this is great. The only thing I would say for something like this, but it's not even that critical because I know you're going to make it into a massive poster is I would say just you make those boxes all just a little bit bigger, but you don't change the size of the text. You, so then that way all the boxes will be a little bit larger, the, uh -huh. the text will stay the same and then the text will just have, you can even like right. move the lines of text sort of, it would just give everything like a little elbow room, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. And actually I have, <laughs> I have, yeah. I have double posters because, because it's, you know it takes it last year it took up like a poster and a half totally. so it was like i just consider well what size is the printer if i like the printer only prints landscape a certain width but i so i'd have to do it sideways yeah it's it's right. figuring all that stuff out no but this, i i think that's yeah. great and i think that's a great again an example of that sort of working through that iterative process of like how do i figure out what my color scheme is going to be how do i figure out oh these templates give me like awesome little push pins, but then four boxes, but I need 12 boxes. So it's like, but at least like I sort of started off with this with my infographic is kind of use those templates for a little bit of inspiration because I do know that like it was a hard, and I know it was a challenge that I just made you guys work off a blank thing yesterday, but that was kind of on purpose. Um, but yeah, I think that's great. And it was awesome, thank you. I could, I could, tr oh. <laughs> You want to give it a shot, Carrie? I could try. I don't know. I don't know. I might just hold up my other computer, but here it is. Let's go. Let's try it. Let's I got. I got faith. Oh God, this is unbelievable. I, I do. You do okay. Share screen. Sit still in the background. Okay. Share screen. Let me see if you can see this. Okay. All right. Wait a minute. Let me see. Double click. Oh, no, nope, we're, we're still just seeing just that one window. We're not seeing the whole. Wait, are you seeing this now? We're just seeing your projects tab. Like Vicky a second ago was sharing and we could see her whole browser. We're just seeing just your projects tab. We want to be able to see the whole browser because we only see the one tab that you shared, which is the projects one. We're not actually seeing the other. It's what other good. one? I mean, you're not seeing my art room thing and then like page two special art events. You're not like I'm nope. scrolling. Nope. We're, we, we, because you, the only thing you sh have been sharing with us is just yeah. the projects tab. So when you share that in, zoom uh, we okay. only see that no matter what else you do which is why you need one of your sharing options is to share uh, the entire program of google chrome which is okay. would then allow you to show all of the tabs we want to be able to share all the tabs. okay wow. all right it's all, all right, right. I, we could i could help you with that later okay all right okay okay i'm off trisha hi i think i can do it let's go um, I clicked a button when you were showing us how you toggle between Scarsdale and something else. So yeah. it, it is possible that I lost everything. <laughs> you, you didn't lose it. It's just now you just have to know that it's in that different team. You can go back to it and then you can, you always have access to it. You didn't lose it, but yeah, it's just there. 
Okay, so you should. Yeah. How do I get back to yeah. me? It's loading. How do I get back to me? So in the top left, if you click that Scarsdale Schools, there should be at Scarsdale Schools. You don't have a drop down. Hmm, that's interesting. I was here before. I clicked that. It was and totally so, so like on mine. Yeah, there's a little drop down on that. Go to the far right. Let me take a look and see what you have on the red TL. I want to see. At Scarsdale Schools. Okay, do me a favor. Go up a little bit higher. Next to the three dots, there's a little red circle. Click that one. That's my icon. No, no, I don't. I just want to make sure sometimes people will accidentally have two accounts logged into the same browser window. I just wanted to make sure that uh -huh. it was the same. Um, that's weird. I don't know why you don't have... Did you do it on a non-Scarsdale account? Did, were you creating it with like a personal Gmail and not with a prior... Uh -huh. Google one, that might be why. No, I, I well, I, oh, maybe if I had to click this, I nope. clicked the Canva like you did. I tried to find Scarsdale School and then everything disappeared. Projects? Project. Yeah, go to projects. So let's take a look and see if it's. Oh, here we go. Here we go. I don't know what happened. So All this, good. what, can you see it? Yep. Sweet. This is what I made um, this morning and last night, maybe if it loads. I do weekly updates um, to say what tests are coming and if there's anything going on, like in the grade, there's any special events and I send it out to the parents weekly. So I made this last night, oops. It has the four subjects that I would give the updates in. So maybe um, I liked the woman who just went, I liked her lines. Maybe I should put like bullets and lines or something. Um, so this would be the first week, week of August 28th, Popham 6, Learning Resource Center with weekly update. There's my graphic, which is supposed to be me. Summer vacation is almost over and it's nearly time for your child to begin their first year at Scarsdale Middle School. I hope that summer has provided with you and your family the irreplaceable time to do what you love. The staff at SMS has been busy preparing and planning to make the 23-24 rewarding and fulfilling year for all our students. And then it would say, you know, here's what's going on in English, here's what's going on in math, here's what's going on in science, and here's what's going on in social studies. That's awesome. Thanks. And I tried to do the colors, like you said, and I tried to include the logo album sort of thing. Totally. And so one thing to keep in mind when you're doing something like this, and I like how you split it up, and I like how you have the, the, um, the shield in the middle. Depending on how much text you have, you may run into an issue of it blocks things. So you may want to make that sort of a lot smaller just mm -hmm. to give you sort of more space for that text. And then I love the thing in the top left corner, week of August, whatever. One thing you can, if you get feedback from people, they may say that they all look the same, so it's hard to discern. They may or may not. A simple way to fix that would be you do a, like two versions of this or like a two pager. So you duplicate this. One week, the boxes are white. The next week, the boxes are gray. So then it's just alternating weeks. So it's like, you don't go crazy changing it up, but you find a simple thing. Now, most likely, especially if you're consistent with the colors and you leave it like this and you just change that week of in the top, that should be enough. But just in terms of if you get feedback that they all look the same, you don't go crazy changing it. You just go, okay, week one, white, week two, gray. We work on white, week two, gray. And then that could just be a way to just offset visually. But again, I mean, I think it's great. Really, the only thing you need I would do right now is make the logo smaller and then align the mathematics, science, social studies, just have them all sort of centered in the middle. Yeah, it was hard. Um, totally. I copied off this one over here and mm -hmm. I sort of adjusted it, but I would save this. I would type on it and then save it as a PDF if I wanted to send it in an email. How would I do that? Yep. Yeah. So you would like just insert text, insert paragraph text, whatever. And then when you go to share, just share as a PDF and it'll download as a PDF. You attach it to an email. You could add it to your website. You could push it out via Schoology, whatever you wanted. Okay. Thank you. That's awesome. Let's go. Sandra. Okay. All right. Desktop, right? Yep. Okay. All right. So um, 
I did something different. I was looking more for color schemes to start out with um, because I figured I'm going to be using this more for trying to use it for every day. Um, so this is kind of the color scheme. As you can see, I, I have a couple things like had that same, oh, shoot, no, you said to go to. Um, yep, right there. Yeah, different tab. Yeah. Over here. Yep. Right. So I was using a lot of the templates and then just changing them for me. I didn't do as much work as everybody else did in terms of uh, trying to rearrange because that is a little behind beyond my um, imagination right now, Chris. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, so I just got a lot of these and just um, basically changed them for me Sweet. for the moment. Um, but I did like the, I like what's in there. Um, like this one is something totally I'm gonna use in class. Um, so I just went in and, and changed it for me. Nice. Uh, and just was choosing the colors that I liked, so. And again, that's sort of an example of like, you might give that out as an activity for the kids to do. Right. But then if you wanted to use this with them, you could give this to them as like a template and be like, now imagine you're teaching French to fifth graders. Right. Change this document, change this activity to be more aligned to lower level French or whatever it is. Well, they could even change this, Chris, because this is writing a story and it's rolling the dice. And so they could change all of these. Totally. Yeah, whatever. Exactly. And that's the point is like you can give it to them for them to do to give back to you, but you could also give it to them for them to make their own. Okay. And then that would give them a little bit of that canvas skill. And then if they have any questions about like, oh, I lost the text, you'll know exactly how to get it back to them because you can support that technical aspect of the activity because you literally made this for them. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. So... And that's sort of the benefit of when you guys build these things is that you then have an understanding of how it was made. So you can then, if you do turn it into a template for the students to make their own version of it, you can then support them from the technical side because you know how it was, you know, built. That's and awesome. What I discovered for the other French teachers is not all, um, not all of the fonts allow for accents. So you have to be careful on choosing your fonts because the accent just won't accept the accents. So that I did. Awesome. Yeah. And so like that right there too is an interesting uh, point, which I never, and I don't think about just as not being, you know, a foreign language teacher, but um, those are great, Sandra. But one thing you could do, and this could be like one of those things of like, if you're going to turnkey this to your department or your grade or something, you may say, you may make a Canva blank thing that literally just lists the fonts that accept the words. And you just list oh. the fonts and then you write one word in that font next to it with the accents. And then you give that to your, your department. Say like, hey, here's all the fonts, you know, Garamond, Helvetica, whatever. And here's what it looks like with the accents. Then you oh, get the right. you know, then you get the Spanish teachers coming up to you and you're like, well, I don't know. Let's check this, you know, do these fonts still work? And then then it becomes like the French teachers. Then you can then scale that out. Like the foreign language department now has a document that lists, you know, the Spanish ones or these fonts. Because I don't know, there, there may be different fonts that support different accents depending on the language. You yeah. guys can kind of create then sort of a universal resource guide nice. for yourselves, for kids, you know, for anything. And that can work obviously at different grade levels. Um, and if you ever notice things like that, those are ways where you can then use Canva to kind of create a resource material for anybody. Thanks. That was great. Uh, let's go, Michelle. Okay, so I feel like my stuff's not as impressive as everyone who's been going. It's all good. Uh, Don't sweat it. So I am a ninth grade teacher. So this is like what I had last year. I made all these things kind of like the night before class because I realized my kids were really struggling with writing. So I was making like writing handouts with them and they were supposed to have like a writing folder for the whole year, but they're like boring looking. And I don't think the kids ever like would look back at them again because they're just like kind of boring. So I kind of was just taking those. And so I changed it to this for how to write a concession assertion thesis, which is the main writing skill in my ninth grade social studies class because we expect them to be able to do this in 10th 11th and 12th grade it's kind of our foundational essay for history 
So I just kind of changed it. And then I started making like the next one, which is like how to write a body paragraph. Um, so I was thinking I could just kind of make it like a little small little book um, oh. of the ones that I have. And then that way, maybe because it's more attractive and there's less writing on it, it's more spaced out. They would actually be more likely to like look at it when they're at home working on their essay. Cause like we do it in class together as like a worksheet, but then I feel like they don't really look at it again unless they come to me for office hours. And they're like, well, I can't do this. And I'm like, well, did you look at the paper that I gave you? <laughs> so maybe this will make it more memorable. Definitely. And I mean, I think it looks great. And what I would say for something like this is you're going to make this book and it may take you a full year to make the book. So mm -hmm. you may just download one page at a time yeah. as an image or a PDF. But what you could even do is if you have a color printer, print it mm -hmm. out, la laminate them, and then you could like tack them up in the room. So even yeah. if you, even if you, yeah, like you emailed them the single PDF or the single image, but then you kind of kind of create single one pages that you can tack up. Yeah, that's that what I'm going to kind of plan on doing. Yeah, and then like next year, and I'll probably print them out for the kids, you know, in black and white. That's why right. I didn't put too much color on it because I wanted it to be easy for me to like to put it into black and white. But then I could eventually, if I just keep making the pages on this one doc, I'll have the whole book. And then in, you know, future years, I totally. can just have that online as well besides the paper version. No, that's awesome. And I think that's great too because you're keeping that full length thing eventually you have yeah a 27 page book or whatever it is of all these resources that you can either give out as a full thing or you could do as like individual things yeah so it was very helpful um i'll definitely be using it in september so i'm excited that's awesome and Thank then you. one thing related to that with the printing out with the black and white is to keep mm -hmm. in mind is print one cop one yeah. single one in black and white to see how your colors work before you run like the class set of yeah i was gonna probably just like highlight them all and change them to black and white yeah but, and, like, but the, <laughs> right but those colors might be okay because yeah they, they might, might be fine. translate as like a slightly gray like more darker gray lighter gray but in general like when you ever you make these things we, we want them to have a little bit of color we want them to pop like you said so that they're engaging but you always want to try to print the one test version of black and white to see do those colors translate before you run like the whole yeah. ninth grade every kid and you're like oh god i just gotta throw all that away you know yeah, i say I that as <laughs> I, I say that as somebody who watches my computer lab printer spin and spin and spin and i'm like oh, just, just print one so it's all it's all good no I think, that, I think it was awesome mary okay okay so I have like a, the welcome, like the like open house, beginning of school year kind of newsletter you suggested. So just kind of, you know, a little welcome letter about both teachers and then uh, contact info with our emails and the Google site. I realized or I never tried it before, I guess, that you can link things on Canva. Mm -hmm. So that's cool because I've never done that before. Um, I was playing around with the colors a lot. I don't love it, but I'm tr I was trying to be like consistent with it, like you said, but this is kind of what I came up with. That's awesome. Yeah, I would say it just needs a little refinement. And part of that might also be aside from the colors is you may do something like instead of the, the colors get a little bit difficult when you have the gradient because it automatically yeah. essentially, it's like green and blue, but then it's also like blue, green in the middle. Yeah you may go a little bit more solid or what you may do is maybe you keep that gradient for the top and bottom box, but then those okay. two vertical ones are just white or something like that. Right. So then that way you sort of have like your bumpers or your, you know, your bookends with everything in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then I would say maybe try to, if you can, if it's possible, try to do a version or a page, like duplicate the page and mess with it with like the box mm -hmm. sizes being the same, but with less text. You know, okay. sort of like strip down the text a little bit because then sort of going to what Michelle was talking about, about like the engagement. Sometimes right. looking at it, a lot of colors, a lot of text, people like zone out. Right. Sort of like Vicky's where there was like big boxes with sort of text yeah. that has a little elbow room. It kind of makes it a little yeah. like people are kind of like, oh, what is this? And they kind of dig into it a little bit more. Um, yeah. And, but I think it's great. You know, make sure your photos are the same size, little, you right. know, I mean, you've seen me, you know how ridiculous I get. With yeah that kind of stuff um, all right 
That's rad. And yeah, I'll show that. That's something we didn't talk about yet, but because she brought it up, I'll share real quick and I'll show you the um, the linking aspect. And there's a couple of cool things you can do. So like what I did with this, with my portfolio is I made QR codes, right? So I created a QR code. So if somebody scanned a piece of paper, it would open up a browser window, right? But you could always click on any object and just make it a link. Now the links will only work if you share it as a PDF or if you share the link to the file so they're clicking on a computer. If you save it as a photo, JPEG, um, you know, SVG, anything that, like that, it won't, the, the links don't work. So just keep that in mind. Like you can click on anything, click the little link button and you type in a link and it'll automatically, if they click on the PDF, it'll open it up. So that could be something that, yeah, if you have your class website, you put it at the bottom, like click here to go to the site. That click here only works on um, the PDF. So you may want to include like the short link, right? Like if you have like the full Google address or if you use something like, like a link shortener, like tiny URL and you make that to your class. So that way, if somebody has the physical piece of paper, they can't tap on the click here, but maybe they'll say like, check out our website you know, tinyurl.com slash Miss Latin, then make that a link. So if it's the PDF, they can actually click on it to go to it. Or if they're looking at it just as a piece of paper, they can actually see what the URL is. So a little bit of, you know. But you use QR codes. Is that a good way to go as well? Yeah, I use QR codes because I just was like, nah, I'm just going to be kind of weird and contrarian because I was a computer teacher turning in a piece of paper as his digital portfolio. It was a practice and irony. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the, so I would definitely say if have the QR code, if, especially if you're doing something like for that's parent facing where it's like information that's going to be hanging outside of your something, right? Like your classroom, your office, whatever. That way when parents come for something like open house, they see it. They may read the thing and be like, oh, the address is scarsdaleschools.org slash Miss Chan. But if they, some of them may be savvy enough that if there's a QR code next to it that goes to the same place, they may just pick up their phone and scan it. So it's not that you have to have it. It's just, it's not, it's QR codes really for when it's a piece of paper hanging up. Okay. You don't need the QR code when it's just a digital um, artifact. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. But you'd still have, I mean, if you did QR codes, you would still have a link written. Yeah, I yeah, I still would. That particular one, I, I made it, I I my portfolio and I the way I did it was like that. If you scan that QR code, it went to the same place as if you clicked on that QR code because I made it a link. And what I did was I taught my principal and assistant principal how to like use an iPad. So I sent them in with like an iPad and a piece of paper, and they actually demonstrated how my portfolio worked. So that's why I was there. But then I emailed the PDF to everyone so they could click. So it was like a, I guess it worked because I'm still here. But um, you know, it was a pushing pushing boundaries back in the day. Um, yeah, QR codes are for paper based things when you want them to access something without having to type in a long URL. I'm still an old school fan of. It doesn't hurt to have the long URL there in case someone wants to look at it, but definitely make it all make those things also clickable links that all go to the same place and share it via PDF so that those links will work. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. So let's go. Who just dropped off? Uh, Kyle. Hello. Let's see if I can do this today. We got faith. Can you see it? Yeah. Great. So in thinking about something that I could put together that maybe I either would print or link somewhere else, um, I thought about this survey that I gave my students. I teach sixth grade math at the middle school. Um, so in the survey I gave my students, I asked them to sort of pick their highlights of the year. So this is kind of like an infographic that highlights some of their favorite things that we did this year. Um, 
I wanted it to look not necessarily organized, but not necessarily um, too messy. Maybe if you were to look at it today and then come back to it tomorrow, you'd find something that you didn't see before, some hidden Easter egg or something. Not, not that there's many in there, um, but I wanted it to look kind of fun since I teach middle school. Um, I went with kind of a black and white with purple, um, pops of purple because Fountain House is associated with the color purple. So I went with purple. Um, when I was making it, I was definitely using a lot of the layers features because when I was trying to click on something and something was in my way, I was able to push it back and push it forward, which I found to be really helpful. And that's not something that I would necessarily do in Microsoft Word. Um, and the grouping too, like even sort of just trying to set up the units of study and the numbers, like I was constantly grouping things together, the text and the images and the numbers. So that was really helpful because then it was just one linked graphic that I could move around pretty easily. Um, and it was fun to play around with the fonts, um, like just trying to make my name over here, like rotate that semicircle. Um, and some of the effects that you can do were really um, fun to play around with. And then I threw in a couple of pictures to sort of showcase what the real world math class in Fountain looks like. That's awesome. And one now, are there Easter eggs hidden in, in the background? Um, if I had more time, maybe I could hide some, but <laughs> but no, there's not. Because I was just to say, like, if, if that background, because it's a little busy, right? Yeah. That would be where you would, if it's a single image or a single background, that's where you would drop the transparency on it. So you yeah. would still sort of see it, but it would kind of be. I did, I did do that a little bit. I probably could bring it down a little bit more, but it was definitely like the background itself was black and white. So I had to sort of gray it out a little bit. So I did do that, but I should probably um, try to make it a little bit more transparent so it's not so busy back there. Yeah, just just so like I like that there's, but if there's Easter eggs hidden in it, then like leave it alone. Or what you do is, especially talking about layers, is you kind of drop that all the way out, but then maybe you make an Easter egg, and you say, all right, my background is at twenty percent. You make an Easter egg as a separate object that looks like the background, drop it to twenty percent, and just tuck it in the corner. So that way, it like it's literally hidden in there where you made a separate item that like is the same transparency and the same whatever and then see if they really notice it it's a really good idea you know i try every once in a while that's awesome all right let's see kirsten okay we good mm -hmm. okay so um much like i think michelle was saying I was thinking about how I could give, I don't want to say boring information, but less exciting information in a nicer way. And this year I found that uh, I teach eighth grade French. When I did the final exam review, I gave the kids like a list of topics and a lot of them were like, we never studied any of these. And I was like, I guess I didn't do a good job explaining, I don't know, the names of certain topics or whatever. So I thought for each chapter, I could do like an overview of the theme. So you can probably tell the theme is like traveling in the beach, um, the goals, what they're going to be able to do, um, the cultural aspects that we'll study, and then any kind of like assessments that they'll have. I also, I guess, was ironic, Chris, and I did a QR code. I was, I don't know, because I, I couldn't decide how I would use this yet. Um, so I thought it might be nice. And then I did like export it. Like, can you see the PDF now or no? Uh, no, because no. you're just showing. So I, didn't, I shared just my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And then I thought I could for every chapter change like the color scheme, obviously the pictures just to make it more, um, you know, interesting. That's awesome. Yeah. And then when you so since a bunch of you are doing sort of um books so to speak right where there's ongoing things whether it be news like the monthly newsletter or these different chapters you can and i'll show you um so if i come over to not this one but if i come to like this one so this one has i added just a second page to it right now there's like a third page a fourth page so i have all these pages when you share this and you have your different download options 
you can, when you go to any of them really, but let's say PDF or printing, so there's all pages four, you can actually then uncheck and deselect. So if you were building all of them, but you weren't ready to release pages three and four, but you wanted to release pages one and two, no problem. You could download, you could just come over here and just, you know, uncheck and only say, I'm just going to check one and two and that's it. And then when you're ready, then the next time, maybe you print, maybe you download the PDF as one, two, three. Then the, you know, you can work on the pages, but you don't actually have to share the pages all at the same time. Works for images too. So if I was going to do these as JPEGs, same thing, select pages. And then it would just download one image or two different image files. So it's nice. And that's what's, that's the benefit of sharing it that way, as opposed to just like giving somebody the link. Because you give someone the link, they're going to see everything. But especially if we're sharing these with students or parents, and you may want to, you may want to be working on the next version when you give out the first one, just deselect the pages so you only share what you want to be shared in that moment. Cool. Joan. Okay, so you can, I think you can see it. Yeah. This is, you know, for the Learning Center for Green Acres, uh, just an overview of what the, of what it does. I had a lot of text, but I, I brought it down so that it's uh, less reading and, um, and more visuals. That's awesome. So that's it. Yeah, with that. Oh, they're great. I would just try to get like if you look in the middle, the globe is kind of like touching the words. When you do those, just try to, you know, space out like, you know, have everything like I've been saying, like elbow room or breathing room, kind of give your text and your images like a little, you know, sort of a consistent amount of space between them. It'll just make it read easier and it'll just make okay. like the, the eye track a little bit easier. But I think it's great. Okay. Thank you. And, and it's great too, because then the kids are not necessarily reading everything, but they're able to connect a visual with what you're saying. Well, and it's re it's really more for the parents. It's an overview that I would send to the parents of what what's done in the learning center. Perfect. That's awesome. And a lot of what I'm sort of been going at kind of in a back-ended way is this concept of infographics. Like we can write an essay, right? We can write a massive memo in a Google Doc and an email. Like that's easy. Like a number of you have said, like you're trying to recreate things that are more engaging. That's kind of the premise behind an infographic, right? Information and graphics, where there's less just heavy narrative writing and it's more like visuals that connect to the simple statement. And that's kind of what I've been sort of pushing you guys to is that notion of like, if we're going to use this design program, let's make something designy. Let's make it look good and be visual and be engaging. Because if you just want to have someone read an essay, just type a Google Doc, like just make them read, right? But there's been great examples of sort of splitting it up and kind of paring down all the words and making it more visual, making it more interesting, making it pop, you know, making kids look for those hidden Easter eggs. That's the difference between using something like a graphic design program to create something and just text, you know, yeah, I'll read the narrative. So that's kind of, I've been sort of back into you guys into this notion of infographics, and then you obviously can make them as word heavy or image heavy as you want. Same thing with the kids. Like you could then even say to the kids, Joan, like, all right, here's this overview of the LRC I gave the parents. I want you to make an infographic with what you think we do here at the LRC. You know, and they may have a sentence and then a picture that represents that activity, you know, another sentence, another picture that represents that activity. And then you're getting them to sort of articulate what they think they do there, you know, and that'd be a way for them to then design their own infographic about what the LRC is at Green Acres. And that's how you might turn that file into a student's assignment, you know, and use your version as the mentor text for that student. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jen. All right. So I did a couple of things because I just sat here for hours, but the templates are really great. So there was this reading template 
that I changed to, well, they had, it was this inclusive classroom one, but I changed it to more of a, I just changed like all the wording and the pictures because I'm doing um, ICT. And during open house, we always go over the different models that we use. So that's what this is. And then, um, Joan, you might like this because I saw something else and then I incorporated like the hats lesson into it. So I don't know, for this was for executive functioning. And then I'm working on an open house pamphlet for third because I don't have one for third. And it was already a template. I'm just like changing things and it's, I'm not, haven't changed anything on the second page yet, but um, when I print this, Chris, I should just print it from like the Xerox one, right? And, and that's going to be one, I always have issues with pamphlets. Like I would print one black and white first to make sure that it's folding in the right way. And oh. then you don't, you don't have to rotate it. Sometimes what they happens- They have like the nice lines and everything. So totally. Like guiding lines, they're, they're pretty good. <laughs> No, no, de definitely. I don't think this is a Canva would be a Canva problem. I think this would more be like our printer problems. Oh, okay. Because, um, like, I'll actually show you, and those are great. I, like, before and I show you, the, and with the QR code, like, how do you make a QR code? So I can show you. There's a few ways to do it. Um, so well, let's stop this yeah. for one second. So one thing is, and this is a little little trick. So I'm going to share this. I have this document right i'm going to share this i'm going to download all four pages as a pdf right because i want to print it but let's say you're going to click that double-sided button on your printer right it may print one of the pages upside down because it's just taking the printer in and coming back out and the printer is just like oh, i don't know i'm slapping some text on here the trick is and it's super simple is in preview so let's go to downloads. So if you open this up in preview, see how I have all these pages on the side? If you just click on page two and do command R, it'll rotate that page to be upside down. And then you can do your, screen, your screen didn't change. Oh, yeah. apologies. Yeah, yeah, apologies. Because I have I did the yep, let me share it again. So let me do the desktop. Um so I have preview open, right? So all I did with the second page is I clicked on it and I just did command R and it rotates it. So if you were to run it through the printer and it printed the backside the wrong direction, you would just, just literally click on page two, command R two times to get it to rotate and then run it through the printer and then it'll print the proper way. So that's just a little sort of hack about some because some of our printers don't don't auto rotate. Some printers will auto align. When you do it, the printer actually will be smart enough to like know that the second page like it'll rotate it. Some of our printers don't. Some of them will actually spit out that alternating pages in that reverse. So just rotate it in preview and then print it, and then everything would be fine. And yeah, definitely print it. Once you know it works out of the Xerox, like one version in black and white, then yeah, then print your bulk 30 copies or whatever in color in the Xerox. But definitely do one test to also see where like the lines are. Like I know their lines are perfect, but where does the Xerox kind of cut off, right? Does the Xerox give you like a border or will the Xerox print the colors all over the edge? Or are you going to get some of your... Because, you know, some of those machines will actually put like a millimeter white border around everything. Um, and since we all have different Xeroxes in every building, it's tough to say which Xerox will, you know, behave in which way. Those are great. And that's where the, the infographic or that's where the uh, templates can be helpful. Like if the templates are good for inspiration and then you're going to take that and kind of hack it up and do the thing, awesome. If the template already has just the exact number of things you need, fantastic you know and then mix and match you know and, and just find the stuff that suits you to make it engaging and make it look good um 
Chris, you're going to talk about how to do QR codes too? Oh, yeah. So QR codes are, as an aside, QR codes are, um, you know, those little images and they, you scan them and they go to a website, right? So each of those little images is unique. So if I, let me come over and do this. So now there are a few ways, and I believe Canva, if they haven't already, Canva is supposed to be putting QR code generation into it by default, but I don't believe it's there yet. You can make, Canva will make a QR code out of your work, but I don't believe Canva can um, create a QR code. However, where you would find potential items like that is down here on the left-hand side, we have apps. And apps are like these little widgets. So what'll happen is they keep adding little apps and little widgets that'll let you do things, right? Like create logos. We'll talk about bulk create next week, you know, auto trades like that, connecting to Google. So this QR code, if you put this in, this is though, let's see, we're gonna open this. So yeah, so this will do it. Now this actually does it. In the past, it was originally it was just enter. You would just go to that and you would say, I don't know, Scarsdale schools.org. You can customize it, background color, change the stuff, mark, you know, you can mess with it all you want, and then just generate code. And then what that's gonna do is I'm gonna move all this stuff out of the way. is it puts a QR code directly on my um, project that I can resize, it's an item. And then that, if you scan that code, like if you pick up your phone right now and we're just scan the screen, it should take you to scarsdaleschools.org. What you then could also do is, if you wanted this to be like a clickable, scannable PDF, that's where then you would come in here and move that. And oh, do they not let you? They used to let you. Oh, so they don't let you add a link to their QR codes because I guess it's like different than a normal image. Because the other way to make QR codes is literally just go into something like QR code generator. And Go to something like this. Don't log in. There's no need to log into any of these because it'll just create um, so like Scarsdale Schools dot org. Oops. And then over here, it makes it. You can put a frame on it if you want. Download the JPEG. Oh, this one wants you to download. So instead, you just control click, save as. Oh, they're getting smart. They want you to log in. All right. So then the other one I use is this one, which is QR code, which is the QR code generator. Works the same way. Scarsdaleschools.org. And then download it. And then. So that'll download, and then you would just come back over here to this, and you could go to uploads, upload files, and I can even just drag. Oops, I can just drag it over. It's a little easier. And there's this one that I just made on theqrcodegenerator.com. Oops, I put that in the frame. I don't want to do that. Let me just put that right there. And then here, they're both, they both link to the same place. So they both scan to the same place. But with this one, you'll notice that the one, delete rodeo. Too much stuff on the page. So this one is the one that I made on the QR code generator.com and just saved it as a JPEG. 
for this one, when I go to the three dots, I can make it also a clickable link. And I could just put in Scarsdale schools.org, right? So that could be scanned or clicked on a PDF. This is the one that I made through the apps, the QR code generator on Canva, makes the QR code, but it doesn't allow me to link it. So for some reason, this little nugget that is like built into Canva doesn't allow you to make it clickable. So if you want to make it, which is fine if you don't want to make it clickable, just scannable. If you want to make it clickable and scannable, just use something like the QR code generator.com. And when you, you make it, you don't log in or anything. You just download it as the JPEG. Then all I did was I come back. I just uploaded it into uploads, dragged it in, the three dots, make a link. Then that's how you can add those elements to any of your pieces. Cool. All right. Haley. Hi. How are you? Good. Um, so I hated my design from Tuesday, so I redid it. And then I really like this color scheme. So I kind of ran with that. Um, and I started by thinking I do this restorative justice program in the alternative school in the high school. Um, and this used to be our guidelines for like running that uh, committee. So I wanted to really shorten that. I didn't want to make it an infographic because um, like it's restorative justice for high schoolers. Like I didn't want them to feel talked down to, um, but I really condensed the information and then I started thinking about like other things that I could do with this design scheme that like I could put up in my classroom. Um, so I've got like a bunch of labels that I'm gonna put in drawers so kids stop asking me where stuff is. Um, I've got this uh, sign, no talking during a vote that I want people to just like hold up during votes. Um, and like how to run the agenda committee, QR code for my office hours unit outlines, places for me to put papers because I have four different preps. And so having color coding is like an absolute lifesaver. Um, oh, and class norms is blank because I usually make those with the class. That's awesome. That's cool. And again, that's one of those types of things that as you're making something like that, you can almost have them, let them fill it in. And next week when we talk about sharing with students, both in a collaborative way as well as templates, you could even have that be almost like a live whiteboard where the kids are just kind of adding the stuff to it as you're going through that process, if you wanted to, if you wanted them to be involved in the Canva design, you know, as part of that um, class activity. That's awesome. Thanks. And I love the consistency of the colors and stuff like that, because then it makes it, there's that recognition for the kids too, about like, this is, this color is a label. This is the document I have to read, things like that. Awesome. Uh, Emily. And then I just need you to unmute. to unmute thank you thanks for the no help problem. no problem <laughs> all right <laughs> um my computer's been really weird today so one of the things that i am actually supposed to do this summer that's worked out really well is uh our school profile has been in publisher for a while and we are trying to change it over or we wanted to change it over to canva so that we had more control over it um so I have been working on trying to get the school profile, how it looked before onto Canva, which has been definitely interesting. Um, I've only gotten two pages in so far, but one of the things that I think I've learned through this is creating um, tables was not as easy as I thought it was gonna be. Like you couldn't get them small enough 
So I ended up having to create boxes and then group and then copy and paste and to try and make it bigger, yet each of the individual uh, rows small, but at the same time didn't put in any of the text before I did that. So trying to make all the text like fit in the appropriate place took some time as well. And I still have to do it with all the numbers, which I'm not looking forward to. But that's what I did. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, and that's so that's one of the things about like we talked about last week about, you know, you, you use like Keynote for some things or Google Sites for some, whatever it is. You guys had this in Publisher, which functions differently than Canva, right? So it's about learning where those kind of gaps are and how to get around those gaps. Um, what I would say in that situation is depending on how static that table is, meaning let's say the table doesn't really change. You, you do it once a, you do it once a year. What you could do is make that table as its own Canva element. So like kind of like a blank eight and a half by 11 type of thing, just make a big giant table fill it in with the words, with the numbers, download it as a JPEG or a PNG, and then drag that PNG into that newsletter. And then it's there, right there. The words, everything's sized properly, everything's done, and you're not dealing with it in this tiny minute detail. You use like a big eight and a half by 11 blank canvas to create just that table. And then that's how you can kind of create multiple elements or multiple assets that are related to a single project that you then can put in. Does that make sense? And that might be the way to do it. Um, we're gonna skip over you, Elise, if that's okay with you, because I feel like you're, you know, in a spot where you might not be able to share easily. So, who, Elisaveta? No, I actually did a lot oh, of work. And no, no, I no, we're gonna go to you now. I was talking to Elise. I was letting Elise oh, know we were I'm, skipping I'm, her. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm sitting on a baseball field, but the game's over. So my kids are playing. So That's whenever fine. you want me to go. All right, I'm we'll ready. skip. We'll skip you for a minute. We'll, okay. we'll let Elisabetta go, and then we'll come back to you. Sorry, that was why, because I thought she was like watching a, a baseball game. So. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I actually like Canva a lot, um, and you know I couldn't stop myself from creating those posters. Um, and I think I'll be using it moving forward. So this is what I worked on. Uh, I'm a French teacher, I teach seventh grade. And like Kirsten, we are colleagues. I realized that my students, once we got, we finished the unit, the chapter, uh, and we have a test, and sometimes they're not 100% sure what exactly will be on the test. So what I decided, I'm gonna create a posters, which I wanna have it in the classroom big, a poster, which I will laminate. Uh, to show students what exactly are we learning in this unit. But I also want to print it out and for them to have in the binder so they can check it while we go and study this. So they can use it while we're studying and then before the test, they can go back. So this is chapter, preliminary chapter is basically saying what we study and then the checkbox uh, to see that. And then uh, first chapter, and then uh, chapter two, and you said about the theme, and I don't know, I was with lavender, I guess I just wanna, I feel like I wanna be in France right now. <laughs> so everything was about lavender. I was trying to get away from it, but it was just coming back. That's okay. Uh, so, but I don't know, I mean, it's just, we'll see how that goes, but that's what I did. And then I'm also taking um, one STI course on managing um, emotions in the times of stress. And I have an advisory group that we all of us have. So, and I thought it would be nice to get a poster about strategies that are helpful and that are not unhelpful. So we can always go back again. I'd like it to be a nice big poster and just, you know, just a constant reminder that it's important to stay positive and not to go into negative emotions. So this is awesome. I love that one. And then my only feedback for this one would just be, especially since there's strategies, just try to keep the text clean. So there's not like the pictures kind of covering a little bit, because if, okay. if kids are going to, or anyone's going to try to look at it, you want them to be kind of quick hits. I love that you have helpful, all purple and unhelpful, all like that gray. That's awesome. I would just try to move some of like that at the bottom, like, um, is that procrastination? Mm -hmm. like it's a little, you know, with all the flowers right around it, we really want to make the flowers are great, 
slide them off to the side so that each of those words and those boxes sort of stands alone and is big and clean and clear so that they can really reference those strategies quickly without having to sort of look through the image. Does that make sense? Okay, that definitely makes sense. And like you said, it's hard while I, while I'm creating, I'm not sure how exactly it's gonna look once I print it out. So visually for me, it's very important. I'm a very visual person. Like I, what you're telling me those little notes, I will definitely take care of it. Thank you. Awesome, yeah, no problem. All right, awesome. Elise, are we gonna try to do it from the outside? Math Ops Meadow, I think I'm connected to the internet here, so it seems okay. <laughs> Let's see. We'll see how it goes. Okay. So, mine is for both. Um, it's, not, it's a little bit of a famous question. But this is for both my STI that's coming up in the fall about teachers as investors, and it's also for my classroom. Um, so I, I use tables and spreadsheets like a lot, but the kids are not um, as well versed with, with things like that. So I was thinking that I can either create like a chart or a table um, similar to what I might have done in sheets um, before and just make it look a little more, I don't know, more approachable, more colorful. Um, so I took um, a document that was already in here, a template, and I just kind of imported images. So something that I realized um, in uploads is that um, I can bring in my own pictures, um, but I wasn't sure exactly like how to craft them and placement and aligning that all up. Um, so even though this isn't like a ton of information, um, it took me a little bit of time to kind of see where all the markers were, like at the ends, and make sure that everything looks good, lined up. Um, I started with the center initially, and I wanted to use this as like a background image and make this more transparent. But I think um, based on what I'm hearing all of you saying and Chris, you too, like you want to keep it more simple and not as busy. So I think not having a background image and just keeping it a little bit more black and white with a pop of color might be a better option. And then oh, yeah. the goal would be um, whether it was like for adults or for students, you know, to take this. And I, I love the idea of taking it and kind of flipping it on the kids. Um, so I can use this as like a quiz. I can take some things out of it and have them fill it in. I can add to our quiz. I use, um, I don't know if you could see it on my screen, but I also use the code generator. Yeah. Um, as like an extension so I do that a lot also I didn't realize you can use it in Canva so I think I'm going to start to do that also so that it's not creating these like huge pages of documents but that stuff is kind of hidden and I can have like one or two sheets I guess that I pull from where it would link to all of these designs that I'm creating. So and I think the no background is the way to go with this because you have enough color between the logos and the little image in the top that that's enough. And then the blue with the text, like that's enough without it being, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot, like and this has come up a lot, like executive functioning and stuff, you know, and often I think, especially like elementary school, we have this a lot and probably a little bit in the middle of school, high school is like there, especially elementary is like all these colors and it's all like cute and artsy but sometimes that's overwhelming and sometimes all those colors and all that information like the visual noise can be hard for some kids to kind of cut through so that's why oftentimes like simple clean black and white two colors is great because it's enough to engage them and enough to pop out without it being sort of overwhelming um just in a visual sense I think it's great. The only thing I would say is like your headers like the total US stock market and those maybe just make the font a little bit smaller even your narrative just to give it like i've been saying like sort of that elbow room where there's like kind of a little bit more white space so it kind of floats because even if it looks small like it'll still pop like and it'll still show up um i think the fox metal wi-fi went out it's all good all right so this is perfect so this puts us at a point of now i'm going to give you something totally new to do because i have to go so i have created a, a video it's all good, at least. Don't worry about it. My last bit of feedback for you, at least, was that 
just, you know, try to give the text a little breathing room. So like, you know, those a little bit more white space, kind of that negative space around like that narrative text. And then your headers are great, just maybe a little bit smaller. So they kind of float in the box as opposed to like bumping right up against the tops. Because even though it like instinctually like, but it's too hard to read. It's like, well, but we're on these little laptops. And by the time you print it out, having that negative space around it, that white space actually helps it appear to stand out. And I think, yeah, no background is great for you. I think it works with the color scheme that's in there. So. I had a quick question just for the other participants because I, I never thought about this before, but I'm glad that you said it also with, um, you know, maybe students who have a hard time reading certain tasks. I remember hearing somewhere that, like, if you're working with students that might have difficulty with reading or, um, you know, figuring out text in, in any way, you should not use serif text. You should use, like, sans serif. Is there a case for that? Is that, like, a, something that I could think of? When I move documents like this, you talk about wait. Say that again. Like ser like using like serif versus sans serif font. Like, is there is it is it easier for students who might have difficulty with the? Oh, I got like, you. Right, right. Um, should, it, should it be focused more on sans serif font versus serif? Because is that more confusing looking? I can't tell because I like how it looks. But, um, totally. you know, just for other people who work with all different kinds of students also, is it better not to have that style? So that would, so first, for anyone who doesn't know, serifs are the little tops on letters. So if you ever have a font, like an I that just looks like this is sans serif, meaning not having the serif. The serif are those little edges. Um, so that's a good question. I don't know if, if There's one is, research on that. Like there's certain fonts, I can't remember them, but I used to use one because my, it was like stuff I took from a coworker and it was like the E.B. Garamond font or something on Google Docs. Like that's terrible. If you have dyslexia, like you cannot, they can't read it. Apparently Arial, which I hate, is like the best for dyslexia. But there's a bunch of, I think you can just like Google it and there's like fonts that are friendly and that Cosmic Sans fans or whatever that like the high school teachers hate the elementary loves so apparently that's like reader friendly too so it all makes sense that it should be used in elementary school um but apparently Arial is what I've heard is the and top. there's one called Lexend on Google Docs that apparently is supposed to be good for kids with dyslexia and dysgraphia too yeah okay so there's there's a couple but like, you can just like it. google it and, and they're all there okay thank you yeah, and as unoriginal as Arial is, there's a reason why that's like the default for Google and um, Microsoft and stuff, because it's just, it's accessible, you know? I know a lot of design, like graphic designers in the past have loved Helvetica, um, but yeah, I don't know. That's awesome, though, to know that. I have never, that's not something that's ever registered for me, but that's all, it's something I got to pay more attention to. Awesome. So here is what you guys have to do now. This is your rest of the evening slash homework slash whatever i have made on that um playlist a 60 10 indie work video that is a 20 minute video based on one new homework assignment where you're actually going to create two things you're going to create two videos with canva how are you going to do that you ask well, watch this video and I walk you through it. I did a whole screen recording on how to do it, where everything is. I have also given you in here a link to Canva's a sort of official video on how to make videos, but it's a little animated. It's not, I don't know, it's, it's fine. One of the things I tell you to make is simple, sort of almost narrated slideshow in terms of presenting information. And then also to think about how you would make one for your students. So I put in here links to two playlists. One is to our immigration playlist, where now both of these, this persuasive and the immigration, we used it with Adobe and Adobe Voice, but it's the same premise, where it's essentially a slideshow that's narrated with some minor animations. So the idea is you can use these playlists, and there's a bunch. There's actually three immigration playlists. I just put one in here. You could watch any of them. They're on. They're all in the Heathcote Tech playlist section. Same thing with persuasive. There's actually four persuasive playlists. You can just go to the playlist section and just take a look at them to get sort of inspiration for what you were going to do. So watch the video. You can do it now for the rest of the evening. Because um, again, sorry, I apologize, but I have this family thing I got to deal with. 
you can watch this now after we hang up, watch that 20 minutes and start making your videos. You can do it tomorrow, but then by Tuesday, we'll watch these and then we'll watch yours, the ones you've made. Use as many of my immigration or persuasive videos in my playlist. And when I talk about my playlist, if you come back here to just the Heath Kotech channel and you just come over here to playlists, that's where you're going to find this one for the summer. But then you could also see there's a 3DO persuasive, a 3D persuasive. Um, and then if you, there's fifth grade immigration ones. So the idea is you can use Canva to create essentially narrated slideshows. So it's not, it's like low end entry level movie making, but it can also be very powerful based on the student examples. And you're going to essentially make one that's you making a movie telling somebody something teaching a lesson, information for parents, whatever it is. The second one is, is if you're going to assign students a project to do, you have to do a version of that project first so that the kids can see it. Basically five slides each. So like a total of like 30, 45 seconds of each thing. But I review it all in the video, that 20 minute independent work video. I go through it. I make one that's in there. You can see it. Check out those immigration and persuasive video playlists to see sort of what the end result looks like. And you'll essentially end up with two videos, one that's strictly professional sharing and one that will act as a mentor text for students to create their own version of it. Cool. And then I will do my best with this horribly slow internet connection to get Tuesday's class uploaded as well as this class uploaded. And if they crash tonight, I will make another just recap, shorter recap one, where I sort of talk about little key points we talked about today, stuff like the fonts, the QR codes, you know, things like that, and the downloading different pages, you know, not having to download the full page and things like that. Sound good? Any questions before we go off and be independent for the rest of the evening? Go in. Awesome. Well, then I will see you Tuesday. Tuesday, we'll do the final session where we'll kind of, we'll review this stuff. But then what we'll also do is we'll make sure everyone knows how to share with students, how to share colleagues, even collaboratively, how to assign stuff. So you can have your own template you can assign. We'll go through all that and we'll wrap up with any other questions and hit any other areas. Okay. So Heath Go Tech playlist, Heath Go Tech YouTube channel, check out that playlist watch my tutorial video you'll make two of your own videos and there's links to playlists with mentor text and inspiration and then i will see you everyone on tuesday cool thank right. you thanks a lot guys